Hey, Mr. Traeger here. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the science of addiction. Um, I got some, some Oreo cookies here. Now you might be wondering, <clears throat> why is he going to have Oreo cookies here talking about addiction? Well, let me tell you, had I not uh, eaten some of these a long time ago, it wouldn't be such a hard thing. Now let me show you how you eat these. So you take these two and you put them together like this. Now watch. You put them in the milk. You just got to hold them there for a little bit. Not a ton. You got to... It's like a it's like a feel. So as soon as your fingers start to sink in, all right, now they're ready. Ooh, mmm, oh perfect. Now the problem here is I can't stop there. I just gotta keep going. Oh, I tell you what, these cookies are good. Ooh, again, you just wait till those fingers start to just. Squeeze into that cookie. Ooh. Mmm. Mmm. I just can't stop. It's so good. Woo! See, that's what addiction's like. You just can't stop. Even though you want to, you just keep going and going. And so that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today is what is the whole deal with addiction? What happens? What goes on in the brain? How does it how does it change? All those exciting things. So <clears throat> today we're talking about the science of addiction. So let's start off with a couple terms first so that we understand what we're talking about. The first term that I want you to understand is the word impairment. And what impairment means is any changes of the mental or physical functions beyond the initial or prescribed effect of a drug. Um, you know, a lot of times we get we get prescribed medications or things like that, and it's going to have an initial effect, a pain-killing effect or a relaxation effect or something along those lines. When we go beyond that, that's typically what we call impairment. We're using something, uh, we're using a drug for something other than it's intended or more of what we're supposed to use uh, and getting, a, I guess, a bigger feeling. That's what we call impairment. Um, the next phrase is what we call tolerance level. The tolerance level is how much a person can use before they feel the effects of a particular substance. All right. Now, a lot of times people think that tolerance level is a good thing and we want to build up our tolerance and all that, but sometimes that's not such a good thing because if we have such a high tolerance that we don't feel the effects uh, for a while, that could encourage us to use more and more of a drug. All right. But that's what tolerance is, is that we're basically, we're basically desensitizing ourselves to the effect of a drug. And then we have this term called trigger level. And trigger level is the point in which an addiction occurs. It's almost like you pull the trigger on a, on a gun, and, and so now you've created the problem, um, that the, the addiction uh, has, has been created. That's the trigger level. You've triggered it to occur. Now, what I want to do is I want to <clears throat> put up a couple graphics and show you how all these things, trigger level, uh, to, uh, tolerance level, and um, impairment all work together. So, let's take three people. We have person A, person B, and person C. All right. <clears throat> now, the red line is going to represent our trigger level. The trigger level can't be changed. That's what we're born with. That's our genetic uh, setup um, in terms of, of what our parents and our genetic line has passed down to us in terms of when we develop an addiction. All right. Now, you'll see person A and person C are very different. Person A's trigger level is very high. Person C's trigger level is very low. What person C could be experiences is maybe has a parent or a grandparent that's dealt with an addiction. Research tells us that if you have a parent or a grandparent with an addiction, you're four times more likely to develop an addiction also if you use that particular substance. If you don't use a substance, you can't become addicted to it. Okay? Now, person A probably doesn't have a family history of addiction, so their trigger level is a lot higher. And B is somewhere in the middle. All right? Now, let's throw in our tolerance level, and that's our sensitivity to the particular drug. You'll notice that person A's tolerance level is, is lower than person C's tolerance level. Now, this is what we call initial tolerance level. It's the tol tolerance level that we're born with. Tolerance level can raise and lower based on the choices that we make. All right? So the more we use a substance, the higher our tolerance level is going to go. All right? Person C is already born with an initial tolerance level that's higher than person A. Again, that's genetically set. Okay? Now, Let's say the three of these people start using uh, at the same time in their lives, and they use at the same rate over the course of the same number of years. Okay, so as person A uses, his tolerance level raises. Okay, 
as person B uses, their tolerance level raises, and then person C uses, his tolerance level raises. Okay, now what we notice here is, is that every single person, A, B, and C, their tolerance level is getting closer to the trigger level. All right, and this is where it becomes dangerous, and sometimes people think that having a high tolerance is a good thing. But in reality, as our tolerance level raises, it always gets closer to that trigger level that triggers the addiction to happen. All right. So as they continue going, person A's uh, tolerance level raises, person B's tolerance level raises, and person C's tolerance level raises. Now, we've seen something happen in person C that we didn't see happen in person A or B, and that's their tolerance level has gone past the trigger level. Well, what that means is, is that they've triggered addiction. So they now have developed an addiction for that particular substance. It could be alcohol, it could be heroin, it could be marijuana. But they've triggered the addiction. Person B hasn't triggered the addiction, and person A hasn't triggered the addiction yet. But if they continue with the same patterns of behavior, they will cross that trigger level. All right? So let's see what happens. As person A continues to use, tolerance level continues to rise, and now we see that person B's tolerance level has crossed the trigger level. They now have developed an addiction. And then as we continue to go, person A, who had the lowest risk of developing an addiction, eventually developed the addiction uh, as long as he continued to, to engage in the same pattern of behavior. All right? Now the point here is, is that even though person A had the least amount of risk of, de of developing an addiction, they developed the addiction um, over the course of time. All right. Uh, person C obviously developed the addiction way early. Now this is what creates some confusion for people because some people develop an addiction very quickly and other people develop addiction maybe more slowly over time and that makes someone like person C think that they were born addicted, that they didn't have a choice in the matter. That's really not true. If person C, even though they had the lowest um, uh, trigger level, the highest risk for addiction, if they never used the drug, they wouldn't have developed the addiction. All right, so we're not predisposed to to being addicted to a substance. It's based on our our patterns of behavior. It's based on the choices that we make. All right, let's take a look at at these two. All right, um, same same scenario. We see two different trigger levels. We see their initial tolerance levels are are close, but we can see the person on the right is uh, their tolerance level is a little bit higher. Okay, so as they as they use their uh, their tolerance level raises, gets close to the trigger level. And as they continue to use, we see the person on the right, they've developed the addiction, they've crossed the trigger level. Okay? Now, person on the left, they're kind, of, they're kind of in a unique situation. Now, unfortunately, we don't know where our trigger level is and we can't tell that it's happening. But let's say something happens to the person on the left and they realize, hey, wait a minute, I need to change some behaviors. Maybe they're dealing with a DUI or maybe they're dealing with some consequences. Okay? And they choose to stop drinking or stop using whatever it is that they're doing. Their tolerance level will then drop back down to its original uh, initial stage, all right? But what happens to the person on the right? As they quit using, their tr tolerance level also drops, but if you'll notice, it, it doesn't go past the trigger level, all right? And this is where we have a biological change, all right? The person on the left could go back to how they used to be. The person on the right has now changed their body chemistry uh, permanently, all right? Um, it's not going to go back to the way it used to be, which means that anytime this person uses they're going to go through those patterns of physical addiction that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. They don't get the luxury of going back to how it used to be. Um, and that's unfortunate. How long does this last? It lasts for two generations. When this, when this body chemistry change happens, it can be up to two generations to finally get it out of your family tree, which means if you have a parent or grandparent with an addiction, you are four times more likely to develop an addiction than someone who was not born with a parent or a grandparent with an addiction. And that's the sad part about developing an addiction is that it stays in your family for quite a long time. All right. So let's take a look at this addiction wheel. How does this work, this whole process of addiction? Well, the first step in the addiction wheel and the addiction process is you have to use the substance. If you don't use the substance, then you can't develop the addiction. If I never use heroin, I will never become addicted to it. Okay. So the first step is you have to use it. Okay. The second stage is what we have is, is drug abuse. Okay. And we hear that all the time. Uh, a drug abuser, people abusing drugs, and what does that really mean? There's three criteria uh, for drug abuse. The first criteria is that if a person overuses a drug, they use more of a drug than they're supposed to or they should, that's considered abuse. Okay. The second one is misuse. If I use a drug for something other than what it was intended for, then that's a, an example of drug abuse. So um, a, a doctor prescribes me uh, Vicodin for a back injury, 
and I twist my ankle really bad, so I take the Vicodin to help with my ankle injury. That would actually be considered abuse because the, the medication was prescribed as a way to relieve back pain, not a twisted ankle. That would be considered misuse. And the third criteria for drug abuse is do I use at appropriate times? All right. For example, um, I'm over 21 years old, so that means that it's legally okay for me to drink. But does that mean that it's okay for me to drink whenever I want? For example, I go to a bar and grill, um, I order a hamburger, some fries, and I order a beer with my lunch. All right, is that okay? Most people would say, yeah, that's fine. All right, but let's say I have to hurry up and finish my lunch because I have to be back at school, you know, before fourth hour. All right, well then that wouldn't be an appropriate time because I'm still going to have alcohol in my system when I go back to school. All right, just because I'm I'm allowed legally to use alcohol, and it's perfectly legal for me to go to a bar and grill and, and, and order a beer. The time in which I'm doing that, the middle of a school day, is not appropriate. That would be considered abuse. Okay, so any one of those three criteria would constitute um, uh, chemical abuse or or any kind of, or abuse of a substance. All right. The third step in the addiction wheel is what we call psychological dependence, and psychological dependence is where I think I need the drug. All right. There's no physical um, withdrawal symptoms. There's no um, there's no physical crises that happens if I don't get the particular substance, but it's something I want. I think about it a lot. I wish I had it. It'd be nice if I had it. I plan for it. Those kinds of things. That that would be an example of psychological dependence. I think I need to have it to have fun or to loosen up that kind of stuff. Right. And the second issue is um, I go through what's called emotional withdrawals. And emotional withdrawals is where I miss it if I don't have it. It's almost like it takes on a personal relationship, just like if you broke up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You think about them all the time. You wish you had them still in your life. Um, it would be better if you had it, those kinds of things. But there's no physical crisis that happens if I don't, um, if I don't have the particular drug. All right? The fourth step is what we call physical dependence. And this is where my, I've crossed the trigger level, and now I'm physically dependent on that particular drug. And there's a couple criteria that will demonstrate if a person's physically dependent on a drug or not. The first one is is that the person is going to go through physical withdrawals if they don't have the drug. All right, they're going to go through shakes, headaches. They're going to have um, uh, night sweats. They're going to have um, irritability. There's going to be physical problems that they have as a result of not using the drug. And a lot of times, if they use the drug, then those withdrawal, then those symptoms go away. That's a clear sign that that's a withdrawal symptom. Um, but but that's that's a sign of physical dependence. My body is now craving the substance, and it has to have the substance in order for my body to feel normal. All right, that's one criteria of physical dependence. Another one is what we call loss of control. And what loss of control is is that I can't stop using um, on my own accord. All right, it's not that it's not that I can't um, I can't not do it. Okay. Um, there are people who are struggling with alcoholism or with drug abuse, and they white knuckle it, and they don't use for long periods of time to try to prove they're not physically addicted. That doesn't necessarily prove physical addiction that they abstain from doing it. What, what a, a better, I guess, test is, is once they start, they can't stop until either it's all gone or they're physically unable to use it anymore. Okay. Um, so let's say I'm addicted to alcohol, and uh, I'm coming home from work. I stop at the store, I buy a six-pack of beer instead of buying a 12-pack of beer. And, and I think that that's a healthy choice because I know when I come home, I'm going to drink all six. If I buy 12, I'm going to drink all 12. That's loss of control. So I'm starting to adjust my patterns because I know that once I start, I won't be able to stop. Okay. Um, uh, and there's all kinds of stories of, of things that people do. They give the, they'll give someone their wallet at a bar and say, okay, only let me spend X amount of dollars. Or they'll tell a person, don't let me drink any more than this. And So they're turning the decision-making over to somebody else because they know once they start, they won't be able to make the decisions anymore. That's loss of control. Once I start, I can't stop. That's a better, that's a better test. Instead of someone saying, well, I'll go a month without drinking, instead they should say, I'll have one beer today. And then I won't have any more. And tomorrow I only have one beer. And then tomorrow I only have one beer. And that's it. Okay? It's a much tougher, um, much tougher thing to do. It's kind of like you or I taking one chip out of a bag, eating the one chip, roll the bag up and set it on the counter and not have another chip for, you know, until tomorrow. It's pretty tough to do. That's, that's an example kind of, not to say we're physically dependent on potato chips, but the, the mindset of that, of the, the ability to stop once I've started, that's physical dependence, all right? 
So what happens is, is we get into this crazy cycle, okay? We use the substance, we abuse the substance by either overusing, misusing, or using it at inappropriate times. It creates the psychological dependence where I think I need it to function or I wish I had it if I don't. Then that can lead to the physical dependence where I have to have it to feel normal and I can't stop once I've started. And as a result of that, I continue to use the substance. And when I use it, I abuse it, I want it, and we see just this crazy cycle keep going, all right? Now, the problem with the crazy cycle here is, is that you are no longer in control. You are no longer the center of your life. What, what's the center of your life now is the drug, the alcohol, the marijuana, the heroin, the ecstasy, the pain pills, whatever it is that you have. That's what's got control now, and that's the one that's going to guide your decisions. And this is why we have people who are dealing with addictions make all kinds of crazy decisions that they wish that they hadn't made that they, they don't want to act this way, that they can't believe that they said this or they did this to maybe their kids or maybe to their wife or maybe their girlfriend because the drug is in control. And the drug doesn't have a conscience. The drug doesn't have logic to it. The drug just does what it does. And, uh, and, and it becomes the central focus for our life. And that's the sad part about addiction. Um, so uh, the next podcast we're going to talk about, we'll have one more left, and that's going to talk about the recovery process and the treatment process of um, – if, if we or someone that we care about finds themselves in this kind of pattern, what do we do to get out of it? All right. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, I am out of cookies. Um, I got nothing more to eat. I got a little bit of milk left. So I guess you could say I might be addicted to Oreos. The only way I could stop was to run out. So uh, that's all I got for you for addiction. All right. Hey. Don't start using drugs. Don't start using alcohol. It's a lot easier to quit when you don't know what you're missing out on. All right? That's all I got for you today. Make sure you check into Kia or log into Kia. Get your quiz taken care of. Um, and that's all I got for you today. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm only going to try meth once. I'm, I'm not going to be like that guy. Hey, look, I'm only going to smoke meth once. I'm not going to be like that guy. Look, I'm just gonna shoot up just, just once. All right, I'm not gonna be like that guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be like that guy. I'm only gonna do my thumbs. I'm not gonna end up like that guy.